Welcome to I See What You Mean, a podcast about how people get on the same page or don't, or perhaps shouldn't. Today my guest is Mika Cross. Mika is a friend and colleague acknowledged as a thought leader in federal government workplace transformation. Mika, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lou. It's so great to reconnect with you and be a part of this conversation today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it very much. Why don't we start with just a short bio so listeners who don't know you learn something about you? Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I got my start in uniform, Mm -hmm. so I am an Army veteran. I served both as an enlisted soldier and as a commissioned officer. After 9-11, I joined the United States intelligence community still in uniform in Washington, D.C., where I helped work on human capital policies and programs and initiatives all across the intelligence community, much of which included work flexibility, Mm. work life programs, diversity and inclusion, and any people focused strategy, really. Mm -hmm. And then I scraped my way across government. I've worked for places like the United States Department of Agriculture, the Office of Personnel Management, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Department of Labor, before jumping over to private industry, where I worked for a fully remote company, working with employers of all sizes, types, and industry who leveraged their remote and flexible work for the purpose of attracting, retaining, and engaging top talent. (laughs) It's quite a journey you've been on. (laughs) <laughs> it's been a fun one, though. Absolutely. Well, and I know you and you're known for being very passionate about your cause. 20 years later, you're still fired up about it. What's that passion about? <laughs> yeah, I am. I think really early on, you know, and I served in a combat support role. So often, by the way, many women veterans don't even identify as a veteran if they haven't served in combat. Mm. And so I started realizing certain intricacies around bias and around Mm. even culture pieces of what it meant to feel like um, you belong (laughs) in terms Mm -hmm. of a team. I served my country twice. And if you had asked me, am I a veteran versus asking me, have I ever served in the military? I might have answered very differently. Wow. I didn't know that, Mika. Yeah. Yeah. So I started paying attention also to, you know, how people interacted with one another. I always supported the quote unquote boys at the time. Um, These are combat arms. These were tankers. These, you know, uh, people in the, in the combat arms field. And my job was really on the periphery. It was to support them before, during, and after deployment which included elements of making sure their families were okay while they were deployed. Oh, interesting. I realized really quickly that that was actually a matter of national security yeah. because if those who are putting their lives on the line in, in you know, international waters and areas of the, the world that are not the safest mm-hmm. and them to pay the, the ultimate sacrifice, the least we can do is make sure that there is a smoother transition and that they have what they need to take care of the mission while they're there. And that things run a little smoother. So I started seeing those kinds of connections. And, you know, I was an adjutant general. I worked in policy and personnel in the military. And so, yeah, I started learning more and more and more about the impact of the pen on how were written. Yeah. So it's, uh, well, here's what I heard. The, the position or several positions you held seem to have given you a broad perspective, but a number of different views into the people part how do I want to say this? The people part of the mission, right? What it takes for people to be positioned psychologically, emotionally, mentally to do the job. Yeah. And and you're passionate about... <laughs> hmm? Any people really, right? Yeah, right. And you're yeah. passionate about getting that part right. What does it take for people to do their jobs well? Yeah. Well, we you, you work in an area where there's a hundred things to talk about. So let's start here. March is Women's History Month, and the theme is breaking the, the bias. I, I think we, it ought to be pretty well known what kind of biases exist where women are concerned in the workplace. But tell me what your focus is now. Tell me what people need to be getting on the same page about when it comes to that theme. Such a great question. Thank you for asking that. And I love this month's theme this year for our Women's History Month around breaking the bias because, you know, as employers and organizations and leaders – all across the world are looking at their back to office, return to office strategy. Mm -hmm. There are equity areas and really significant impacts Hmm. to how policies affect people in the workplace and also 
equity issues in the workplace in ways that maybe we hadn't considered before. And so not only does it impact potentially women at different rates that it would, uh, uh, you know, impact men. Okay. It also, the, your strategies, your policies, your, your um, protocol, even, right. are you're going to conduct business post-pandemic, mm-hmm. most certainly have equity implications. So one of the things I'm really passionate about right now is working with leaders to understand where those hidden biases might, or what they might look like in the workplace. Looking at data in terms of who and what positions are qualified for what kinds of flexibility. Interesting. As you look to reintegrate teams back into a physical space, even on a hybrid basis, are we looking for blind spots in areas like proximity bias and recency bias? Because if you have a preference as a leader, but you're leading a multi-generational, you know, with five generations of workers that all have different preferences and competencies and abilities Mm -hmm. to work in different ways, and some choose not to come into the office, is there an impact to how they are promoted? Is there an impact to how work is assigned? Sure. Is there an impact to how you quote unquote see them if mm-hmm. they're not physically present? And all of these things. So this all sort of really wraps in nicely to the current times of what organizations are thinking about. And there are a lot of ways that we can talk about, you know, being aware and kind of looking for those blind spots moving forward. Let me ask that question. When you were saying that, I was thinking... The change in work location, workplace situations during the pandemic might have served to highlight some things that it would be an opportunity to fix things that the pandemic might have highlighted were broken or were biased or inequitable. Is is that true? Did did the pandemic highlight some things? And are you do you see executives now, government or non government, going, Okay, as we recover from this, as we create our next new normal, there's some things we gotta fix. Is that what you're working with them on? Yeah, a lot of a lot of areas in, in that, you know, dialogue, including when you take a look at those who are eligible and actually participating in remote or hybrid work pre-pandemic, you might be surprised to know that the majority of teleworkers, which now we're referencing as hybrid, but teleworkers were actually men over the age of 40. I love I love your use of data. By the way, I just always <laughs> love, you really ground a lot of what you do in data, which I think is fantastic. Very important, you know, because if we don't understand exactly who is sitting in which positions, and typically women and minorities, people of color, and individuals with disabilities, traditionally in most workplaces, sit in positions that are like mid level manager and below. Mm-hmm. When you look at the people that are occupying primarily most of your mission essential, mission critical kinds of occupations, and at the senior leadership level and executive level, take a look at the demographics. And then next say, which positions were, you know, where I consider it, was I considering traditionally eligible for what kind of flexibility and who opting into that? Because that is a clear bias right there. So as you come back to the workplace, (laughs) considering things like, who does coming back to work affect the most and who is able to make different decisions around where and when I work? Are my policies impacting women and people of color differently than they are men or you know, other demographics of workers or even other occupations? And what can I do to change that? Because as you know, Lou, you know, we're talking about Women's History Month and to the tune of nearly 2 million women workers mm-hmm. in the United States alone that were parents or and or caregivers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those women had to drop out of the workforce. And so as we look to reintegrate and leverage women as a critical component of our talent strategy, it's really going to require taking a hard look in reality <laughs> around what our policies say and how they might affect different demographics of workers. So a company might have said, hey, we've got X percent of our workforce that's that's teleworking or hybrid, or hybrid. But if you looked more closely into that number, you'd see it skewed in some obvious ways. They might have been more male than female. They might have been older than younger, maybe more white than non-white. Is that what you're saying some of the data show? Could be, could be, yes. And I certainly don't want to, you know, use yeah. that as a one-size-fits-all sort of model. But it's important data to look at to look. from an our analytics perspective to look. you know what is the bottom line who's opting into what flexible options for instance 
traditionally are support roles. These are your admin support, your front office staff, those kinds of positions were ineligible to routinely and regularly conduct work from home or from an alternate location because they had to be physically on prem on site. Well, you know, fast forward to the turns pandemic. out that wasn't so. Yeah, it turns out that was a flawed logic. You know, and guess what? Shocker, we have you know <laughs> the ability to digital sign things and not have to print out everything hard copy and be able to route things How electronically. About that? How about that? So when you bring them back, are you allowing some combination of choice and preference along with complementing what the mission requires and what your preference is as a leader? Because what your preference is as a leader may not be and likely isn't the same preference as those other five generations of workers who are following you and also emulating you to look at what a career path looks like in your organization. And if your preference quote unquote bias is for physical right. <laughs> work done only in the office and you can't wait to get back and you're vocal about that. And even if your policies allow it, your preference is for those that are sitting with you right there in the mm. room next to you. Mm. People are going to see that they're going to watch that and they're going to pay attention and they're going to vote with their feet. See, to me, in my mind, you sort of bookend some things like you start with data and you're always at the other end. The other bookend is you're always driving at the mission requirements. So, it might be that what the mission requires, what, it, what an executive believes the mission requires is partial or incomplete, could be, uh, bias is a systematic thing, so it could be biased, could be, there could be systematic preferences that he or she has, or just unknowns that they don't know that if they had information on, they'd say, well, that makes me rethink eligibility. That is such an important piece, Lou, that you bring up, because often leaders get worried and nervous that, for instance, if they have this policy that authorizes, you know, choice in maximum flexibility, that everyone's going to just want to keep working from home 100% all the time. When in reality, you know, the data, I'm going to bring it back to the data. <laughs> Good. The data Good. Knows right now in most organizations that like 15 to 20% of your workforce will want to work that way. Wow. The rest actually do crave purposeful, meaningful interactions in person with one another, but they have to be designed around, again, the mission and for a purpose. They are not going to want to be forced back in an office where you may or may not have to wear a mask. You can't see the person's expression anyway. Take meetings from your desk anyway. Right. Not able to have those social connections or those collaborative interactions. And, and have to endure two hours of commuting each way. You know, that's not strategy by design. I like <laughs> and that. it's also not, not an employee experience by design kind of model. Often leaders will think like, I have to equitably apply this policy, whatever that policy may be, in the same exact way for everyone. You don't, but you have to make decisions the same way. Meaning for this particular position, if there's a requirement for you to be on premise for a specific equipment or in, in office interaction or security reason or what have you, customer service reason, because we're having right. customers come in person, then that is a business reason. And therefore, we can't allow fully remote every day, but we can allow you to choose different kinds of work schedules that might flex around your personal needs, too. Therefore, you're still able to extend maximum flexibility and some choice, because at the end of the day, workers want to know that you trust them to be able to choose yeah. what works for the mission first and for their lives second. Wow. There's just I'm jotting down some notes here. It's easy to frame the conversation as in cer with certain buzzwords, remote or telework or and the, the focus becomes who's not in the office. But you just said something that was very important. The focus should be on mission accomplishment. It doesn't matter if you're Coca-Cola or you're, you're the Navy. Mm -hmm. And what are the best work arrangements to achieve the mission? So it shifts, it shifts the aim. To, in my mind, Mika, it shifts the aim. It isn't just what's the right remote workplace policy. It's a bigger question. There's a remote workplace piece of that, but that's not really what it, this is all about. It's much bigger than that. And that serves a means, that, that's a means to an end and keep it in perspective. It, you, you nailed it. And it was a really big deal for the nation's largest employer in some agencies mm -hmm. pre pandemic when they started allowing Wi-Fi access in like the cafeterias and the library and the yeah. sitting areas. And do you know most people, when they really wanted to interact and 
and sort of do some creative kind of ideation and innovation, they would pick up their laptops and leave their office and go have, grab a coffee with a coworker or have lunch together and like look at some things together, you know, and they were able to do that. And that was like such a big deal. You know, we are in a different way of working. And then we just had millions of future workers who are coming to work for you and me mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to work with who just had the biggest remote slash hybrid experiment of their lives as young as age four. <laughs> mm-hmm. They are coming to work for us. These kids have had to also transition mm-hmm. to remote working and learning. They've had to be able to learn how to be present without being physically present. Right. And their coworkers, their teachers and such as right. early and as young as age four. Yeah, you're right. Think about the transitioning high schoolers. Yeah. These Kids are resilient college students. They are coming to work for us right now. And they are going to want to have some choice in how, when, and where they work. So to your point, it's not just about remote. It's not just about hybrid. It's about do you trust, hold accountable? Can you offer a variety of flexible work arrangements that work with the position and the person? And then do you hold them accountable? (laughs) Fair. Yeah, right. That's a fair point. So uh, I, I think a lot about changing the conversation. So if the goal is to be on the same page about something so that presumably smarter decisions are made, smarter plans are put in place, more effective, there's way there's help, things that help us get on the same page, get in the way of getting on the same page. Sometimes we can't and we've got to manage that. Mm-hmm. How does somebody, how are you helping people? How are you hearing executives re-ask the question of themselves, so it's more broad, framing it more broadly, framing it more strategically, for the enterprise, for the, for the largest goals, the, the, gra- the broadest, grandest goals of the, opera- of the enterprise. How are they having that conversation? Because it seems to me it could be overwhelming. There could be so many things to think about, so many things yeah. to consider. HR could be losing their mind because good, bad, or indifferent. They got a lot of policies that could change. How do you start that conversation and have it uh, and even a modest sized organization, let alone something the size of some of our federal agencies. I'm going to say right now it's a hodgepodge. I mean, you look at any of the current headlines and you see the biggest tech companies all of a sudden changing their tune saying, nope, just kidding. Come back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the biggest thing is to consider that a one size fits all approach is not the right approach <laughs> in either way, in either direction. A one size fits all approach is never going to meet your business needs because it won't meet your people's needs. So I I think first getting really clear on, again, on the business reasons for meeting in a co-located or physical location, you know, there are. Well, that was the question I was going to ask you. Can I ask, did the pandemic help certain leaders have that aha moment about that question and go, you know what? I'm seeing some things differently. Did it make some people rethink the situation, rethink the questions, change the conversation? I think for sure it did. But one thing I've learned (laughs) in dealing with organizational change. But, good but. (laughs) You're never going to change the mind of a naysayer. You can throw all the tangible data, the cost savings, the ROI, the business cases. They are always going to come up with a reason why. They can either discount that information yeah. or don't want to Well, that's do where it. some bias would and, come in. And that comes down to personal preference, too. So, I mean, many leaders. Well, you're many being kind leaders, if you say preference. <laughs> that could be a bias. I, that could be a yeah. strong bias. Yeah. You know, who have a preference of not working from home. I mean, some people hate it. They feel isolated. Mm-hmm. They don't mm-hmm. want to look at their spouse or children all day long. You know, they've been feeling really isolated and not connected and yeah, for no, legit not... want to come back to work. But your preference and mandating that other people fall in line with it likely isn't the, the right arrangement. So did so did the pandemic make them rethink that one size business? Are they thinking, ah, maybe one size doesn't fit all now? Did they have that experience or not so much? I mean, I think some did because we, we have data, you know, I mean, look at Flex Jobs. They work with the the international companies around the globe. And there was an uptick of, gosh, I wish I had the data right in front of me, but um, uh-huh. I think it was upward of 20% increase in fully remote and they're staying remote. So um, many employers are just going to continue keeping that model because it did work. Some aren't, you know, you have 
really old fashioned traditional industries like the financial industry, the legal industry that is just used to getting work done, even the military and and bureaucratic organizations like typical public sector organizations that were used to get work done in a headquarters building Mm -hmm. slash office. And they cannot wait to go back. So it's going to be the ultimate experiment, right? Because just as we were forcing everybody without a choice or preference. Right, right. Back in that day, right. Well, now we have the luxury of time and we can be more thoughtful and strategic about what it will look like to then, quote unquote, force people back into an office. And if we don't do it thoughtfully and with, again, a combination of business reasons and preference from the workforce and extending trust, but holding accountable, then I think we're going to fail. And you can see that happening, Lou, with the great resignation right now. And people are people are done with not having a choice in how they spend their time. And so, yes, you know, we have to work to, to make a life for ourselves. Sure. But there are many employers that are hiring that do offer a variety of different kinds of flexible opportunities. So my hope is that they have learned and that they will be introducing some of the, the lessons learned into, you know, their policies and strategies moving forward. Well, I'm a good example of some things you talk about. I'm 61, so I grew up in a time, my first job out of college was in the 80s. I worked for the federal government from 89 to about 97. And then I've been a consultant since, and mostly an independent practitioner since. But I I, I was sort of raised in that time, the mindset that that's just the way it was. And sometimes, and, and sometimes time in your at your desk in the office isn't the most productive or the most or the most optimal for productivity your, uh-huh. your your point about people taking the laptop and going to some social space to sit with others and work is a great point from my personal experience i don't know what data there are to to, to back that up but but sometimes getting away from the cubicle or walls if you have them being in a different environment fosters some collaboration or some creativity. Your your mind can do, you know, I, I I had a buddy who worked from home for a long time and hated being at home, loved to be at a Starbucks or a Panera. He liked the environment. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how can you concentrate in there? He said, I, I don't know. I, there's a rhythm in that place and I pick up on it and I, I work to, with the noise, with the activity, with the, and I didn't understand at the time. I kind of figured it out. I, I worked from home a long time, pandemic having nothing to do with it. I mostly work from home, but I love to take a break once a week or twice a week and do that. And mm-hmm. it's a, and it's a different energy. And and we're not just talking about something that preference at the level of oh, Lou likes that and it makes him feel good. Let him do it. That's not the point. The point is productivity. Are you bringing your best to the job every moment, every day? And if not, why not? And if the, yeah. work, if the workplace is getting in the way of that for you and others, we're not talking about individual contributor here, teams of people doing tasks, doing projects, doing programs, isn't there a better way? Look, we all leave our desks to go to the a conference room to meet. Isn't there a better way to meet, to work together? And if so, what is it? And if, if they're right there for us and we have a bias against them, what, what are we achieving? Are we cheating results aren't we cheating outcomes aren't we cheating people in the passion that they they bring to to work and aren't we diminishing that i think there's consequences that you're right a, a, a bias a person could say doesn't matter i'm still doing i'm bringing them all back and we're all gonna sit in our cubicles well you know even though we were forced into this work from home experiment well let's just talk about the government you know 61 percent of government workers were working remote the rest were still on premise on site on location they were still you know needing to be somewhere but many managers were figuring out how to navigate that new normal during the pandemic and how they were going to connect their teams and how they were going to keep the mission going by basically calling meetings to work in order to work requiring video beyond all the time whenever you meet with someone keeping your little light on green, you know, if you're on yeah, 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 yeah. some other kind of collaborative technology and it was burning people out. I mean, yeah. you couldn't keep up with it. And then let alone the caregivers and parents who also were pulling triple duty in the home 
trying to work in locations that were less ideal mm-hmm. with distractions at home. And so that Zoom fatigue, quote unquote, was a real thing and burnout and anxiety and the impacts of that, it's going to spill over. Well, you <laughs> it's me- not going away. You mentioned trust and accountability a couple of times. Let's, mm-hmm. let's talk about that because what you're just yeah. talking about right now, I think goes to the trust question. Yeah. If you're being asked to always have your video on, always have that be connected to that system so that it, it, it's a main, it's a means to an end some manager has presumably of knowing what you're doing or of knowing you're present or available. Doesn't say anything about what work's getting done. <laughs> it's kind of a poor measure and it, it, it lacks trust, which is like, I think the first mistake. Yeah. And it's a poor measure of, it's not a good means to the end that a manager might want to be able to report up the chain of command and say, no one's here, but everybody's working. What's the conversation going on today about using different kinds of measures like results or output, outputs or outcomes? Because outputs are a re- legitimate result. What are people thinking these days about other ways to, to measure or to report accountability than presence? Yeah, well, that's forcing the hand of organizations that were stuck in the traditional you know, industrial age way of managing performance, which is yeah. minute by minute, hour by hour punching a clock for right. 8.5 hours a day right. with one 30 minute break right. or two, two 15 minutes. Minute. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sadly, the nation's employer still is much like that. And so the hands of managers are tied in some ways because they have to certify that time worked was time paid. And that really is an unfortunate design, in my opinion, giving the number of knowledge workers versus those kinds of more blue collar or on site kinds of positions that require a time based work requirement versus output and outcomes necessarily. So it's really tricky for organizations that are managing knowledge workers and in, you know, a variety of occupations. But I think this conversation is evolving. Many pr- people in private industry are doing away with perform the mandatory annual performance appraisals and instead replacing it with meaningful performance conversations on a regular ongoing basis, which gets rolled into how you assess someone's impact and contribution to whatever the mission or the bottom line is, and then therefore how you get compensated and rewarded for it. So what I like over the last two years is seeing how especially public sector managers have been able to lead with more, I don't know, a humanized approach Mm -hmm. to work. And having these kinds of conversations, even asking things like, is there anything that, you know, might be preventing you from getting your work done? Or what do you need at this time in order to help meet this deadline? Or listening when someone's saying, you know, I have these three ongoing priorities that are all due at the same time. And I have a three-year-old at home. Mm -hmm. So which one of these would you like me to maybe Mm -hmm. put out if that's able to be done? So having more conversations grounded in reality where we don't necessarily have to hide the things that are contributing to potential issues with meeting deadlines, outcomes, and outputs is, I think, a really positive was thing. A, yeah. Yeah. You you made the point about the type of job, some types of job might require presence in a certain location. But that's just a that's just a location question, even if you're on an assembly line. If you're still better off if you engage the men, the minds of the men and women on that assembly line, well, they might have to be there physically. If they, they've got a mind, and if you and if you engage it, mm-hmm. they like their job more. They'll be more productive. They'll be more safe. And 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 this kind of data is out there. Um, you know it. You know it probably pretty well because it's your line of work. Mm-hmm. I know it from some work I used to do. And one of my uh, a podcast episode, I'm lining up with somebody is a VP of health and safety. And he's got phenomenal data on how he changed the culture of the shop floor. And he'll tell you the kind of conversations that he'd use to do it and how, how it increased safety and productivity. Yeah. Unmistakably, like you, the graphs on the curves are crazy. And he engaged, and it wasn't like he said, all right, we're going to, he walked down and said, we're going to do things differently starting starting now because I'm here. Nah. What he did differently was how he engaged the people there to say kind of the questions that you were 
mentioning before. What's working here? What's not working here? What do I need to know? What do I need to get out of your way? How mm-hmm. can I help? Right? It was more of a servant leader kind of thing where he's saying, mm-hmm. you're doing the work. What do I need to know to help you get the work done safer and better? So the data, is, the data are out there. And even though somebody might be, it might be appropriate for their piece of the mission for them to be located in an office or in a factory, that doesn't mean that you don't treat them like they don't have a brain. Right. And it also doesn't mean that you can't extend them other kinds of flexibilities other than remote yeah. <laughs> work. And oh, so talk about that. Yeah. You know, about 10 years ago, I got a call from the Virginia Parks and Rec Service, and they were trying to figure out this, this flexible work program, their work-life policies, and how this was going to work. And they're like, well, we have these park rangers mm-hmm. and, and these these park leads that their whole job is to be on the trail to be and out <laughs> around and showing them you know the different things in our great parts in this state how would we do that for them while other people can participate in remote work and i said well why don't you ask them mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so like, know. they know what their job is they know what their job is they know what the requirements of the job is to remain employed and do a good job on behalf of the citizen. And yeah, maybe to do the job <laughs> they love. Yeah. Well, they love it. You know, some of these were here like, you know, 37 right, years. Right. Um, perhaps they might say, well, I could, uh, you know, come in early. Maybe I do a six to two shift and Mike over there takes a two to eight or whatever it might be. Or maybe we do a job sharing arrangement. Or maybe I compress my work schedule and I'm off one day every two weeks. And that allows me to have time with more time with my family and and those sorts of things. It also potentially can cut down on the number of hours of overtime that you're paying out. I remember the state of Kansas had a really big issue with paying millions of dollars to their public servants who were coding time to overtime. And they did this pilot project where they condensed the work week to four days Mm -hmm. versus Mm-hmm. So they did, they said, you know, for those who want to opt in, do four tens. Mm-hmm. And I think about 60% of the workers wanted to opt in. And they saved like $2 million in the first year in overtime. Because by the time you reach 10 hours a day, you don't want to put any more hours. You want to go home. <laughs> mm-hmm. But they also had one day a week off mm-hmm. in addition to the weekend. And people were more joyful and they were more productive and they were engaged. So there are different ways of doing that. Invite your workforce to the conversation. Ask them, not just their preference, but how hmm. that you were to be granted this kind of work arrangement, how would this job be done? How would you be responsive to customers? How would you interact with the team and make sure we're kept up to date with your priorities and what's going on? How would you be able to meet those demands? So I think that's a really important I, piece. I think the specificity of those questions is is critical. It isn't a vague conversation about what would you like with it, no. I know I know a little bit about customer experience, and I'm always surprised at how much it really applies to work, worker experience, too. The companies that innovated the best didn't ask the customers what they wanted, because if you do that, you find mm-hmm. out some things that aren't real helpful. They want everything, the same features and, and attributes, but they want it faster or cheaper. So, something that doesn't really tell you, it doesn't get deep enough. You have to ask more specific questions or make observations. Yes. How does the customer use our product? We might think they're using it. We might know how they're using it, but we might find some things that are hidden from us. We we don't we couldn't see unless we went out and observed and realized they're using it in ways to solve problems for which it wasn't designed. Well, we could we could add value. We could create something new to help them with that. Innovation came from knowing what the customers needed that were new value adding yeah. new value, ask yeah. employees the kind of questions you asked, not would you like a, a general, of a, a vague general thing. Get specific and have, to me, it's a little bit of, they're honest conversations. They might be a little harder, not in the sense that they're difficult, but just that you've got to think about, before you go in the meeting, think about what you want to talk about. Make it, make it real. Engage them in that way. You get, you get ideas. Yeah, this was really important. You can see this play out pre-pandemic also, when larger employers were investing all this money in that open office cubicle concept. Yeah, right, yeah. (laughs) And they were redesigning their office space and they created like innovation hubs and phone booths and little conference rooms here and there. 
And then you had this big, huge open bay where like, it didn't matter if you were an executive or a high level leader or the workforce, you were all there together and nobody wanted to work that way. And people were getting distracted by someone's perfume or someone microwaving, you know, their fish dinner for leftovers <laughs> at lunchtime. Yeah. And people were in the office with headphones on because they couldn't focus and they needed some quiet. It was not <laughs> working. So now you're talking about organizations who are also investing money in redesigning office space along with their back to office strategies. And they're redesigning office space based on pre-pandemic levels. And so it's like you're you forgot that again the the user experience the user experience is your workforce. It really is. It's your workforce. It really is. Number one, top priority. How do they want to work? What will give them their best way to give you their best work and to to deliver that mission to whatever customers or stakeholders you have? And how do you make sure that they feel supported and that they have some choice? People just want some choice in the matter. <laughs> they just want some choice and they want trust and they want direction and they want purposeful work. It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a note here. I love how you pose that. What will give them the best way to give uh, you their best work, their best work, their best um, an outcome. So that's what you want from them. It's not that hard, but boy, it seems to evade people. I call the show, I see what you mean, because it's about that aha moment when, that somebody might have, that insight that shifts perspective and, and gets them on the same page with someone like, all right, now I get what you're trying to tell me. Amika. Then we have a different conversation after that moment. Mm -hmm. But also thematic in the show is but we don't always get on the same page. That's just not always the outcome. Maybe we're working toward it. Maybe it's not going to happen, but we need to do something and perhaps work together even if we're not on the same page. And so what are your thoughts? What's your advice about if you can't get on the same page, what do you do? Uh, I mean, still document, document, document. <laughs> and I'm not, for remote, hybrid, and hyper-flexible teams, this is make or break. You must come to a decision around which meetings require a video and which don't. And you can do that through a facilitated discussion right. and coming to a consensus together. Can we agree that in this scenario – we're going to do a meeting this way. And in this scenario, you might have a choice of whether you want to engage by phone or by Zoom or by what you know whatever other means you might have. Right. Maybe for our one-on-one -on -one check-ins, if we're not having to make notes, we can give you a choice to do it by phone and do a walk and talk. And so we're still together, but we're also outside moving and getting some fresh air. Can you give workers choice, but also document your processes? In what scenario requires a meeting? We do not need to meet to get work done all the time. Right. In fact, we shouldn't. And so hyper effective and successful, you know, hybrid and remote teams document their process. They use the right mix of synchronous and asynchronous work. They help teach the team how to leverage the collaborative technology together because there are different levels of competency and um, mm -hmm. familiarity with those kinds of tools and be, you know, graceful and patient, but like, expect that people are going to come prepared. This is the agenda by which we're going to yeah. guide how we work together. This is the agenda by which we're going to do this kind of a meeting. Is this a decision-making meeting yeah. or is this an informational update status meeting? What is the purpose? Are we going to be respectful of our time? Are we going to start and end on time? What if we don't? These are all things, even, you know, like the agile methodology, it's great to emulate. There are so many best and promising practices on how to do this. But the problem lies when you don't figure out how to document what you're in agreement on, what your expectations are of the team. Good point. And how do you get on the same page when you're not going to have the same opinions or shared experiences? Not everyone will. But then how do you move forward? And so these sorts of office norms, office protocols and standards are really key to successful teaming, no matter the location. If you carefully document what you don't agree to, if you carefully document it, you might find out it's not what you thought. Mm -hmm. You might be able to narrow it. You might make it more specific. You might have an aha moment of, oh, I thought it was something else. And I realize if it's better defined, you have a better chance of doing something about it. Even if you could agree, not just to disagree, because that just kind of leaves it in a disagreement sure. state, but agree to, how did you say it before? 
well, like how we're we gonna work together to resolve some of those things. Like in my opinion, like even asking questions like how might we? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. How might we? If this is the. Can we agree that this is the objective? Can we agree that this is the goal, the uh, desired outcome? What can we agree how on? Might do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. those are just important ways to sort of get, and you can get a variety of answers. And yes, you can. Well, that's good of- because you've got more options to try or to, so exactly. I, I toy with the definition of getting on the same page that is very succinct Mika. And I think relates to what we're talking about, agreeing enough to take the next step together. Yeah. So if you and I had a difference in policy, you're, you're in one department, I'm in another, you're one executive, I'm another if we had a dis- disagreement about something, but we agreed to take some next step together, that might be to do some more discovery, mm-hmm. to do some more if-then scenarios, pilot or sent, you know, try some things it, where experience teaches us more about than we know, fills in some gaps, maybe turns some unknowns into knowns, maybe, God forbid, highlight a bias. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> highlight a bias that we go... Oh, I guess I better rethink that one. So if we agree enough to take the next step together and come back and say, what did we learn? I think you get, we might not always agree on everything, but I think you start to build more agreement, narrow disagreement. What's Mm -hmm. more, you build some trust. Yeah. And, you know, as you move towards those more documented processes or arrangements or, you know, office norms, let's say team norms, you know, even thinking about, so what happens if we don't? do what we say we're going to do, you know, and in terms of remote and flexible teams, well, if we say that our once a week status update meeting is going to be videos on Mm -hmm. and someone routinely does not come prepared with their video on, maybe that person needs to come take the meeting in person and that can be their choice. Either you work from home with your video on for this meeting or you can come in in person and we'll put you on the screen sitting next to me. Or you can ask, is there a reason why you don't want to turn on your video and can I help solve for that? Maybe they need a reasonable accommodation. Certain people have different comfort levels with being seen and heard on a video screen. Maybe they have a real significant issue that would qualify them for a reasonable accommodation or a change in protocol or practice. I just think those are ways to hold people accountable. And that's the other piece next is also getting clear on how do you manage performance and conduct regardless of location right and it is a manager's responsibility to uphold those standards it's a pretty easy one you know if i tell you this meeting is going to be camera on and you don't do it once and i say come to the next meeting with your camera on and you don't do it twice third time i can get rid of you because that means you're disobeying (laughs) a request or order at least in the government space versus performance is you can't do something because of X, Y, Z. You, maybe you need some training or extra coaching or whatever. Conduct is when you won't or don't. And accountability is not just right in that instance. It's right for the team. There's nothing worse for a team culture or organizational culture than to watch people whose conduct is substandard and, let it, and, 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 and nothing happens to them. Right. It just poisons the culture. Not upholding their responsibility either, or you know what we agreed to as how we're going to conduct our team. You know, back to preferences, and you had the episode on different communication styles, and there's different learning mm-hmm. styles, mm-hmm. There's different working preferences, and some people don't have an ideal setup, or they have things in their lives that just right. they don't want, you know, visible. That's okay, provided the standards you set for your teams are being met, and if they're not then it's up to you as a leader to either extend some grace and flexibility around that based on the reason or an accommodation or what have you. But that also requires establishing relationships together with each other, with your direct reports, with other leaders and other, you know, even your customers to hear back for how, from how things are going. Bringing someone into an office and have them physically present isn't going to solve for those things. Right, (laughs) right. No, you just you need to cover over them 24 hours a day. Right, you know, that's right, right. Important. You just kind of move the problem to a different location. <laughs> Let's come back to where we started, which was the uh, the theme of breaking the bias. Anything that you wanted to close yeah. with on that? If you haven't taken a look at your HR analytics data, first of all, you should have it. If you don't have it, find it. 
leader of any organization, it's incredibly important and powerful information to take a look at who is sitting where, you know, what is their demographic, um, what is their background, what is their tenure, uh, what is their education level, what positions are people holding, what positions are eligible for what kinds of flexibility, either pre-pandemic or now, and then marry that up with your people strategy in addition to your organizational objectives. I think that's a really great starting point for being aware of some of those hidden biases around flexible, remote, and hybrid work overall. And that will help inform your strategy moving forward. I couldn't be said any better than that. Bias comes, our brains, our brains are, we're probably wired, we're, we're, we're wired to work with some shortcuts and they can become biases, right? We, there, there's just, there's a lot of research on that we don't need to go into. Just say, our brains are wired to work a certain way we can make fast decisions, and we often need to for, for for reasons. But biases can be built in, and you not see it. Sometimes being told, "Hey, I think you're, you know, you're biased on on X, Y, and Z." Maybe somebody is open to that. Maybe they're not. Data can always help show what you what you're not seeing. If you've got if you're making decisions based on what you think is the right evidence, and then you look at data and you realize you see five other things. That's a, that's a great aha moment to have. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you, Mika. This has been great. Yeah, absolutely. This was fun. I hope we get to do it again. It's a huge topic. The fight will go on for a long time. But I loved having the conversation with you about what's working and what's not working to get people on the same page and make the workplace better. We, there's so much more we could talk about. Maybe we'll circle back another time and have a different part of the conversation. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for having me, Lou. Thank you. Have the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that's how we see it, my friends. I want to thank Mika for recording today's episode. You can find it at icwhatyoumean.castos.com, plus all the usual places. Send questions and suggestions through an app. Subscribe and give me a five-star rating unless you can't, in which case, tell me why. And join me next week when we take another look at how to get on the same page and stay there, unless we shouldn't.